we serve a God who's on the throne. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We uh, got into this last Sunday night and we didn't get very far. And so we're going to finish up chapter 6 uh, this evening, uh, Lord willing. And uh, just kind of at this point, again, just reminding you, I, I think you, you have the basic plot line of the book of Judges pretty well in your mind. Uh, the people uh, sin against the Lord. Uh, the Lord sends judgment upon them. And then um, you know, they cry out to the Lord. God sends a deliverer and rescues them. And there's a time of peace. And then we see that cycle over and over and over again. And so as we went into chapter 6 last week, we saw the same story with just new characters. Right? We saw uh, the, the children of Israel in verse 1 of chapter 6 did evil in the sight of the Lord. And God sent, uh, sent an enemy in, to, to judge his people. And it was the Midianite people. And remember, uh, the Midianites were a wicked, sinful people. They were a semi-nomadic people who uh, really, they were just, uh, they were a band of marauders. They would come in uh, every season and they would absolutely ransack Israel. They would wipe out the crops, they would take the livestock, and they would leave the people with nothing. In fact, when they would come in, the people of Israel would literally leave their homes so they would be safe, and then they would come back to nothing. And that happened again and again for seven years. And uh, after seven years, they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord does something a bit different. Uh, rather than immediately sending a deliverer or a savior, you remember, he sent a prophet. Um, and I, I just want to go over what we talked about just to bring you back up to speed with where we're at. But uh, this is not the norm as we've looked at the cycle. God's responded to the, the cries of his people with a deliverer, a judge. But here he sends a sermon instead of a savior. And the whole point being is to prepare their hearts for what is to come. To remind them that the problem is not Midian. right? The problem is them. They have forgotten the promises. They've forgotten the covenant they've entered into with the Lord. And... They have sinned against him. And so in their heart, in their mind, the problem is outside. And God sends a, 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 a prophet to say, the problem's not outside. The problem is you. Now, they don't get that, right? And so, you know, after the, after the prophet, God, we, we see in verse 11, it actually says the angel of the Lord appeared. Now, remember, that's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ or a theophany, uh, which, which simply means that God showed up. Now, that's a, that's a familiar pattern for us in the scriptures, right? God sends a prophet, and then he sends himself. And so that's what we see happening in Judges chapter 6. And we're introduced to a, a new character in, in chapter 6, and that's a, a young man named Gideon. And Gideon, actually more time, uh, more verses, and more scripture is devoted to this man Gideon than any other judge in the book. And so because they spend so much time on Gideon, we're going to spend a good bit of time on Gideon. Uh, looking at uh, how the Lord uses him. That was really the emphasis behind our beginning last week was, you know, God has saved us to serve. God wants to use you. God wants, and, and I pray that's your desire tonight as you sit here, that you don't want to just be a pew filler, that you have a desire to serve the Lord. And, and so then the question was, well, how, what, you know, what do we see? What marks do we see of someone that God uses? And a couple of things we pulled off you know, early on, and that was God uses men who are working. We saw Gideon you know, tr you know, treading out the... The, you know, the, you know, beating out the, the wheat and, and we said you know he was active he was busy and God uses those who are active and busy and, and you see that throughout the scripture he finds men who have their hand to the plow and he pulls them away for his service uh, we also said that God uses weak men uh, and so I, I just again we're going to look to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together and we'll jump back into this this evening Father, I thank you for uh, just the, the joy it is once again to gather together with your people and to worship your name. We, uh, we look forward to this time, week after week, where we can come together and fellowship with one another and bear one another's burdens and, Lord, worship you, for you alone are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. And I thank you uh, tonight for your word and how you speak to us. Lord, I thank you for your faithful people who uh, desire to serve you, who want um, to honor you with their life, I pray that you would just work through your word and through your spirit, uh, that we might be conformed more to the image of Christ, uh, that we would be found uh, in your will, accomplishing your purposes for your glory. And Lord, as always, I pray that you would just uh, 
You would use me in spite of myself for your glory. Lord, may uh, you accomplish your purpose in us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Let me just, again, we're going we're gonna to be starting about verse 25, and I want to bring you up to speed where we're at. We said this man, Gideon, we kind of come across him in verse 12, and I'll try and sum up for you what takes place there. Essentially, the angel of the Lord, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to Gideon. He says, Gideon, you're going to be a mighty warrior, and you're going to deliver the people of Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon says, nope, you got the wrong guy. Right? And, and so God says, no, nope, you're the man, right? I got the right guy. And Gideon says, are you sure? And the Lord says, I'm sure. And so Gideon says, how can I be sure? And, and the Lord says, watch this. Right? And so in about you know, verse 20 to 22, we see uh, a, a, a sacrifice that Gideon has prepared. And he just wipes it out. It burns it all up and consumes it. And then he's going himself. And Gideon's standing there going, uh-oh. <laughs> I was just in the presence of the Lord. And he, he, you know, he's fearing for his very life. He thinks he's going to die, and, and then he gets the message, Gideon, you're not going to die, I'm going to use you, right? And the whole uh, wrapping up in verse 22, he builds an altar there to the Lord, Jehovah God, the one true God, and he says the Lord, Jehovah, is shalom. The Lord is peace, right? Jehovah shalom. And so, again, that reminder, until you have peace with God, you cannot be used by God. And, and so, important reminder for you tonight. You know, I think sometimes we have high aspirations, and it's possible for unsaved people to get in the church, to get involved in the church, to be even actively serving in the church, and feel as if they're doing great things, and be lost. And so, I, I say that just as a word of warning to you tonight. If you're here, and you do not truly know Jesus Christ, I see this happen where people kind of enjoy the fellowship of the people of God, but they don't enjoy Jesus. <laughs> right? they, and so the idea of actively serving is in some way them saying, you know, if I just do enough stuff, then God will love me. And the reality is until you have peace with God, God's never going to use you. He's never going to use you to accomplish his purpose. And so above all things tonight, as you sit here, make sure that you're in a right relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that you know Him. Right? He is peace, yes. We are justified by faith and have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's where we left off. We see this man, Gideon, who's questioning, Lord, I'm nobody from nowhere, and you don't want to use me. You've got the wrong guy, and God says, no, i got the right guy. Right? So... And such an encouragement, again, to us, just the reminder that God can use you. I think so oftentimes we look at ourselves and we say, God can never use someone like me. So take heart, Gideon's nobody, from nowhere, and God's going to use him in an incredible, mighty way to deliver his people. And so that's where we left off. He built an altar to the Lord, and then we come to verses 25 and 26. It says, it came... To pass the same night, the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father has, and cut down the grove that is by it. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. All right, so that very night, that very night that God had came and brought this message to Gideon, he puts him to the test. He says, Gideon, I've got a job for you to do. Now, this is not deliver you out of the hand of the Midianites' job, right? This is, this is a test for Gideon. He says, I want you to go home, and I want you to tear down, I want you to take your father's bull, one of them, and I want you to take a second one, I want you to sacrifice it, and I want you to tear down the altar of Baal in the grove, which is a, an altar, or an idol to Asheroth, the goddess, and I want you to tear them down. Now, clearly, Gideon comes from a family that are idol worshipers, right? I mean, in his, at his home, there's an idol to Baal. And so he says, I want you to go home, and I want you to tear this idol down. And, and it's just a reminder that 
if we're going to be used by the Lord, then the house cleaning must start here, right? It, we must, we must, before we get rid of the enemies around us, we must get rid of the enemies among us. And, and so very important for us just to keep that in the back of our mind tonight as we're thinking about, is God, you know, how am I going to be used by God? Well, we've got to deal with idolatry in our own life. This is, you know, in Genesis chapter 35, God called Jacob to go to Bethel. Jacob immediately went to his wife and to his household and his servants. He said, Genesis 35, 1, Jacob said, all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Immediately he says, we've got a, we've got a clean house. And, and so let me just encourage you tonight. If you want to be used by God, you must put away any idols in your life. Now, <laughs> I know, right? Sometimes we talk about idols and we have strange thoughts in our head about statues and, and totems and different things. But we've talked about this enough to where you know that an idol is anything that you put before God. Anything. Right? So it, you know, we're not talking about some, some altar to Baal or some pole that worships some foreign goddess. We're talking about very real things that we deal with day in and day out. I wonder, I wonder if there's something in your life tonight that you need to tear down, that you need to get rid of. That's what, that's what the Lord is telling Gideon. Gideon, if we're going to go about this and we're going to see genuine revival in the land, then it starts here. I wonder, I say, what kind of things are you talking about? You tell me. <laughs> you know, right? You know in your heart. What is it that stands between you and the Lord? What is it that you trust in? What do you run to whenever trouble comes? Do you run to the Lord? Or do you trust in your own ability, right? Do you run to the Lord or do you trust in your finances? Do you run to the Lord or do you trust in the certain relationship that you have? What is it that controls your thoughts and your mind and your devotion day in and day out? What is it that is on your mind when you wake up in the morning? What is it on your mind when you go to bed at night? If you stop for a moment and you think about those things, then very quickly you see your idols. Could be your job. Could be a relationship that you have. Right? A boyfriend, a girlfriend. It could be a hobby. I mean, it could, be, it could be any number of things. Whatever it is that consumes your mind and your thoughts, it's taking the place of God himself. And so, brothers and sisters, tonight, my encouragement to you is this. Look at your heart and ask yourself, are there things in my life that I need to rid myself of? And then, do it. Do it. Tear it down. Get rid of it. That's what God is telling Gideon to do here. God uses devoted men, single-minded men, right? And, and so, you know, we finished up James, right? Double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The problem that has taken place in Israel is that they have become syncretist. You say, what in the world is that? They've mixed their worship of Jehovah with the worship of Baal. And they've mixed their worship of Jehovah with the worship of other gods, false gods. And, and, and this is happening today so often. I, I hear people say, why do you Christians have to be so closed-minded? Why, why do you have to, can't we just kind of put all this together? And the answer is no. Christianity is closed-minded. It is very singularly focused on one God, the one true God. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory I will not give to another. God is a jealous God. He wants our worship. He wants all our worship. And so it's good for us to stop tonight and hear the voice of the Lord that says, tear down your altars, tear down your idols. Now, Gideon hears this message. He hears the word of the Lord. And how does he respond? We see it in verse 27. 
Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. That's awesome, right? He responds in obedience. But notice it says, and so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. <laughs> you say, you coward. <laughs> now, let's be clear. What God asked Gideon to do was not easy. It's, um, we're not talking about conquering the Midianites, but Gideon, I want you to go home. I want you to take your dad's bull, and I want you to sacrifice his prize bull, and I want you to tear down this altar. That's no easy undertaking. You know it's no easy undertaking because he's got to take ten men with him to do it. Big job. Not only that, but people worship this thing. And his fears are not unfounded. We'll find out very soon that Gideon's fears are very rightly founded. If he does this, people are going to be angry. They're going to be upset. They're going to want to kill him. And so, you know, we can look at that and we say, you coward. Why didn't you just go do what God wanted you to do? But I don't know about you, but I think I'd have been more like Gideon. You know, for us, let's, let's stop for just a moment and say, he may have been afraid, but he did it. Now, that's better than a lot of us are doing, right? A lot of us are really quick to look at Gideon and say, what a coward. Why didn't he just do what God told him to do? What about me and you? Why don't we just do what God tells us to do? It's easy to sit and, and, and kind of critique and criticize when we're not doing anything. I, I remember D.L. Moody, he said, I like my way of evangelism better than your way of not doing it. <laughs> you know, God desires obedience in his people. And too many times Christianity has become a spectator sport where we sit back and we, we enjoy the singing and the worship and the preaching and we, we leave the place of worship and all we have to say was, well, that could have been better and that could have been better. And I think, but what are we doing? Are we doing anything? God has given us very clear instruction in his word. You know, Gideon left that, that day knowing exactly what God wanted him to do, and he did it. I am convinced that when God's people gather together and his word is preached, that his spirit is at work, and I believe that every single time you come that God is impressing upon your heart something. I believe that. If not, I'm wasting my time. And so the thing for you and I is what? To respond in obedience to what God is telling us to do. To be willing. And that's what we're seeing here. If we want to be used by God, let us be willing to be obedient to his word. Well, Gideon does it. Overnight, he goes and he tears down the altar of Baal and the Asherah. And notice the response. Verse 28 and 29. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Well, <laughs> there goes that. Doing it in secret didn't work. Right, he had ten men who were involved. It didn't take him long to track down who the culprit was. You know, it was early in the morning that they got up. You say, what, why, why did they find out so quickly? You know why? Because Baal worshipers didn't skip their morning devotions. Isn't that, doesn't that strike you? Very early in the morning, why is this detail? Because they were up early to worship this false pagan god. I wonder how many of us would get up early to spend time with the Lord. How many of us would take time to worship the one true God? Here's false pagan idols. They're hoping we'll give them some crops. And they're, just, you know, they're pleading with him early in the morning, send the rain, send the rain, bring the crops. The Midianites are coming. 
They were devoted worshipers to a false deity. And it's clear that they're not happy, right? Gideon's actions, they were unpopular and they were countercultural. Can I say and remind you tonight that God will call you to do things that are unpopular and countercultural? Not everyone's going to be happy with what God calls you to do. Sometimes God calls us to share the gospel with someone that is very close to us. We love them. I understand sharing the gospel with your loved ones is one of the most difficult things to do. And sometimes they're not happy about it. But does that mean we shouldn't respond in obedience? Sharing the gospel. Troy, Troy's been talking about Sunday nights about sharing the gospel with strangers. You know what? I've had the door slammed in my face a few times. Not everybody likes that message. It's an offensive message to tell people that they're sinners and they need a Savior. People don't like to hear that, but they need to hear it. Unpopular, countercultural. I've seen young people called into the ministry, called into the mission field. Very clear call in their life. And the people who should be supporting them, who should be encouraging them, are saying, you don't want to do that. I've seen young people who were called to go to Bible college and parents going, we're not going to waste our money on something like that. You say, why do they respond that way? Because their worship is somewhere else, right? Their worship is on finances and on success in this world and not on eternity and what God has called us to do. See, This is what's happening, and getting responds in obedience. And then we see in verse 30, it says, The men of the city said to Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he has cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the grove that was by it. Does this not astound you? This is remarkable. This is the people of God. The the very people that God delivered out of, the, out of the hand of Egypt and who brought them safely through the wilderness and who brought them into the land, the promised land, victoriously, is now saying, bring out this Gideon because he tore down an altar to Baal. We're going to kill him. What irony. You know what Deuteronomy outlines for, for false idol worship was death. Who should have died? The Baal worshipers. This idol worship should have been squashed long ago. And no one bothered to lift a hand, but one man stands up for Jehovah God, and they're ready to kill him. It's not so unusual from today, is it? You can say anything unless you say it in the name of Jesus. (laughs) And then people are not so happy. Well, Gideon's dad does what any dad would do. He stands up for his son in verses 31 and 32. Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one has cast down his altar. (laughs) Gideon's dad simply says, And and the irony here is is that it was his place that this Baal worship took, you know, it happened. But now he's standing, if Baal's a god, let him contend for himself. If Baal's really god, let him defend his honor. Oh, that Israel would have learned that lesson. Unfortunately, they did not hear. We see this play out again, do we not? On On Mount Carmel prophet of Elijah. If God is God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. They didn't learn. And they repeat this again and again. And so it says, therefore on that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down his altar. He gets a nickname. <laughs> a nickname, it means let Baal contend. Right? People begin to call him this. You know, the, contender, the contender with Baal. And, and they're making fun of him. They're laughing at him. 
because he did what God called him to do. This is nothing new, right? That's how Christians got their name in the book of Acts. It was a, it was a title of derision, and they grabbed a hold of it. People will not always be happy when you follow the Lord's will and obedience. And some people will mock and some people will laugh. You're in good company. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was mocked and he was reviled and he was spit upon. And yet, he says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Count it an honor to suffer in the name of Christ. And so Gideon grabs a hold of that nickname, Jeroboam, and he runs with it. And we'll see them refer to him that way again. So with Gideon, God started small. Give him something little to do. Not really that little, but it was little in comparison to what God had in mind, right? And so he starts with something small, and it leads to something big. And, and so, again, a reminder to us, if we want God to use us, we must be faithful in the little things. Remember the parable of the talents? Jesus you know, shared that in Matthew 25. Uh, and then you know, the faithful steward, the one who made good with what Jesus had given him. In Matthew 25, 21, it said, His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Right? So there's just a, a parable of stewardship that God will use the faithful in other ways. So if you want to be someone who's used to the Lord, be faithful right where you're at in the small things and then watch as God moves and works. So God begins this big tax we see in verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. All right, so round number eight is coming. The Midianites are gathering together with enemies of Israel, the Amalekites, and they are going to raid the land. You say, you know, what are we looking at here? We're looking at 135,000 plus raiders, marauders, who are coming to absolutely plunder and pillage the land of Israel. And so they gather on the cusp of the land, and here's Gideon. But notice... Verse 34. Things seem bad in verse 33. But then in verse 34 it says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer, which gathered after him. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon. And we see a transformation Gideon suddenly becomes what God said he would be. God said, Gideon, you're going to be a mighty warrior, a man of valor. Gideon said, you got the wrong guy. But now, under the control of the Spirit of God, others begin to see this man that God said he would be. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Right? God is going to equip Gideon to accomplish his purpose and other people begin to see it. How do you know? Because they follow him. Gideon becomes the leader that God said he would. Isn't that a great promise? You know, when, when, I, when I read Judges chapter 6, you know, for the longest time I would, see, I would see him call Gideon, this mighty man of valor, I think, is he making fun of him? <laughs> you know, Gideon's the farthest thing from a man of valor. But he was calling Gideon what he would be. And, and brothers and sisters, I look at the New Testament. He calls us saints. I don't know about you, but I'm no saint. And yet, what, what does the Scripture continually tell us? We are saints. To the saints in. To the saints in. Why does he say that? Because that's what we are, and that's what we will be in Christ. Right? And, and so we see this picture here. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, Men begin to follow. So Gideon blows his trumpet and men begin to come and gather together to fight this battle. And it's just a reminder that what God calls his people to do, he equips his people to do. I don't know what God's called you to do, but I do know this. If God is in it and he has called you to do it, 
then he will equip you to do it. I always think of the old quote by Hudson Taylor. I know I've shared it many times. God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. You know, we see here God preparing, equipping Gideon to accomplish this purpose. And where does it start? With the Spirit of the Lord. If you want to be used by the Lord, be filled with the Spirit. Surrender and submit yourself to Him in every way. And, and watch the results. Verse 35, he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali, and they came to meet him. We have an army forming. 32,000 men come from around. <coughs> they gather to fight this battle. Now, I don't know about you, but that's still not great odds, right? You got 135. Plus, with a herd of camels, and then you got 32,000 men. And we'll see the irony (laughs) as we look at uh, chapter 7 later on. But Gideon is looking at the picture, and you'll notice something. We see a man in verse 34 who is responding in the Spirit, and people are following. And then suddenly, as he looks at the circumstances ahead of him, He's no longer controlled by the Spirit. He's controlled by the flesh. So how do you know? Well, look. Look at verse 36. We come to the very familiar picture of Gideon's fleece. Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, (laughs) behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it, will, and it be dried up upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl of water. What does Gideon do? He's kind of looking at this army over there, and he's saying, God, I don't know if I'm the, I don't know if I'm the guy for this. Now, if you're going to use me the way you said, isn't that ironic? If... You said, God said it. That should be enough, right? But Gideon's looking and he's saying, I don't know. And so, can you, can you give me some clarity here? Now, let's be clear. Gideon doesn't need anything else, right? I mean, what more do you need than the person of Jesus Christ standing before you and saying, this is what is going to happen. But, Gideon's afraid. And so he comes up with a test. Now, you know, I, I want to be really clear. We start talking about this fleece thing. You've got to be very careful. People like to take this and use it. <laughs> Some of you may have tried this, right? I, I'm just going to test God out to see if I should do this or, 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 or you know, if, if I should go here or if, if, whatever. Be very careful. This is, number one, it's the only place in the Scripture that you see it. You don't see God's people determining God's will anywhere else in the Scripture like this. So be very careful, and we'll kind of we'll talk about that a little bit more. But what I, what I believe we see here, obviously Gideon is not saying, is this your will? He's saying, God, can you confirm this for me? I know what you want me to do, but I want you to reassure my heart. Now, what I see is the grace of God here. God could have easily said, Gideon, you're a, oh, you have little faith. I can find somebody else to do this. I mean, you really are a nobody from nowhere. And I've I got some other candidates that could, could lead this army. <coughs> but he doesn't do that. He reassures Gideon's heart. Gideon laid out very clear guidelines, and God met those guidelines. Should have been enough. He does it again. Right? Verse 39, Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me. He does fear the Lord. I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on the ground. 
God miraculously shows Gideon again. Gideon, this is what I want you to do. You're the man for the job. Go do it. And it's, it, it's God's grace reassuring his heart. It's God coming along a servant who is, yeah, if you jump forward to Hebrews chapter 11, Gideon's in the hall of faith. It may be weak faith, you know, but it's faith. And so Gideon's just saying, I don't know if I can do this. You ever been there? I'm there every single week. I promise you. I shared that with you so many times. I I don't enjoy speaking in front of people. <laughs> and the more I do it, the more I get used to it. But the weight of the weight of sharing the word of God is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I know I'm going to stand before the Lord. I'm going to give an account for every word. For whether I rightly divide the word of God. I'm incapable. And yet, God in his grace, week after week, proves his faithfulness. I don't know, what has God called you to do? My guess is, it's probably something that overwhelms you. God tends to put us in those places. Why do you think he does that? Because then we look to him. There's time and time again, when I get comfortable, God likes to stretch me. And so I, I just, I, I'm sure tonight that God has placed on your heart something that he wants you to do. Maybe it is sharing the gospel with a family member. Maybe it is sharing the gospel this week with someone that you come in contact with. I don't know, but I believe that God is calling his people to serve him. Maybe it has something to do with your future. Where are you going to go to college? Who are you going to marry? Yeah. Maybe, maybe God is, you feel God calling you into full-time service. Maybe you, God, you may feel God calling you into a ministry within the church. That can be very overwhelming. Maybe you feel God calling you to volunteer within the community. I don't, I don't know the myriad of ways that God is working in the hearts of his people, but I know that he's working, and I know that he's calling us and I know that that can be overwhelming and it can be stretching. And so, how do we respond to that? Oh, I pray we respond in obedience. Now, what is Gideon doing? He's saying, God, I just don't, I'm just not sure. Is there anything wrong with that? Nope. Nothing at all. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, I'm not sure about this. Can you, can you guide and direct me? Nothing wrong with that. God says, trust not in your own understanding, right? Lean not on your understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he will direct your step. Nothing wrong with going to the Lord and saying, God, I'm just, I'm uncertain about, through this whole foster adoption process, we've been just doing that day after day. God, I'm not sure about this. Are you sure about this? You know, and we just keep taking another step, taking another step. And that's a lot of times the way God works. However, this whole fleece thing, that's another thing altogether. That's not saying, God, I'm not sure. God, I don't know which direction to go. That is, that's putting God in a box. <laughs> right? And it, it's never good to put God in a box. Right? God, if you want me to go here, then <laughs> give me a sign. <laughs> you know, God, if you want me to take that job, then make sure I get a call at this time tomorrow. Right? I mean, people like to throw fleeces out. And um, history shows that don't work out too well. I've seen people walk through some doors they never should have walked through because they threw out a fleece. It's, it's a dangerous thing. God doesn't tell us to put a fleece on the ground and test him. He tells us to trust him. He tells us to follow his word. You know, most of the time, most of the time, we know what God wants us to do. It's not complicated. God, God has revealed much of his will for us in his word. Now, there are things that are uncertain, right? We start talking about some of those big things. Who am I going to marry and where am I going to go to school? Those things are maybe not as clear, but do I need to pray? Do I need to spend time in his word? Do I need to be, you know, in the, ho- in, in the Lord's house when it's open? Do I need to share the gospel with people? 
There's no question about those things. Those are things that God has clearly revealed to us in his word. And so the only thing for us to do is walk in obedience. If you want to be used by the Lord, be faithful in the little things. But understand, Gideon wasn't throwing out a fleece to say, God, is this what you want me to do? Right? Because he already knew that's what God wanted him to do. He was simply affirming what God had told him. Not, should I go here or should I go there or what should I do? And we're going we're gonna to spend a, a good deal of time with this man Gideon over the next, well, I'll have a break for a few weeks before we get back to Judges you know, with uh, Christmas activities and programs. It'll actually be the first of the year before we get back here. But spend some time yourself. Read, read Judges chapter 7 and 8 on your own. And watch how God uses this weak man in incredible ways. And be reminded that God can use you. God can use you. So We'll close in prayer and, and, and we'll be uh, dismissed tonight. Father, I thank you for uh, your time, uh, our, this time and your word, how you speak to us. Your word is living and powerful. And oh, I'm so thankful tonight that, that you choose to use us at all. <laughs> well, the psalmist has said, what, what is man that you are mindful of him? why you would choose to, to use unworthy servants to accomplish your purpose is beyond my understanding. But you do. You, uh, we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So I pray we'd be faithful. I pray we would be a people who follow your word in obedience. Lord, it's very possible tonight that there are those here who have things in their life they need to tear down, they need to get rid of. Tonight, before they leave this place, Father, I pray. Pray they would just make that very decisive decision. Maybe it's some sin that has dominated them for far too long. Maybe it's not sin at all, but just a good thing that has become a God thing. Oh God, whatever it is, May your spirit move to accomplish your purpose. Lord, I ask all these things tonight in Jesus' name. And amen.